Thank you for joining us for this episode of the Myopia Podcast. Today, we're with Dr. Mark Bullimore. We're going to be talking about, is myopia a disease? Uh, can it cause visual impairment? And why each diopter matters? Optometric Insights Media proudly presents the Myopia Podcast, where we give you the latest myopia research, clinical topics, and industry insights. Make sure to subscribe to stay up to date on all of our awesome myopia content. And now to our host, a massive myopia manager himself, Dr. David Kading. Well, thank you for joining us for this episode of the Myopia Podcast. Uh, I'm here with my my good friend, Mark Bullimore. M Mark has, has really uh, been a, a leader in this world of myopia over the last 15, 20, 30 years uh, to date you, Mark. Um, and... Uh, <laughs> And Mark is, uh, as, as many of you know, is a, a British trained optometrist who uh, has a PhD. He's been in the United States. He's spent a considerable amount of his time um, at Berkeley and Ohio State. He currently lives in Colorado. And Mark has contributed to our industry in so many ways. One of the ways that he does is to help companies and help products that uh, figure out studies that will help uh, help us to understand better about uh, what's what's happening in the myopia world. Uh, so if you haven't seen Mark in the myopia space, uh, you may be a little myopic because uh, he's everywhere. He's out there and he is really, really helpful. So Mark, thanks for what you're doing for our industry and thank you for joining me for the Myopia podcast. It's a pleasure to be here with my good friend, Dave. <laughs> well, absolutely. So, M Mark, you know, I, I, I want to actually talk with you quite a few times about quite a few topics, but I thought this would be a good scenario for us to have you take us through a little bit of where we've come in myopia, particularly, let's talk a little bit about risk factors. Let's talk about, um, you know, some things that we can do outside of just, uh, you know, orthokeratology and, you know, soft multifocals uh, to help slow things down and so forth. There's been a lot of studies on that. Um, but let's talk a little bit about the disease of myopia and this concept that uh, it's progressing and what do we know about the causes of myopia progression? There was a lot there. Did you follow that's, me? Yeah, that's that's about 30 <laughs> minutes. You, you should take, take a breather, Dave, because you're not going to be talking much for the next uh, half hour. So, well, let's... Oh, I'll interrupt you. I'll interrupt you. <laughs> <laughs> so. Um, let's unpack a few things um, a bit at a time. The first thing that I think is important that you said is you described myopia as a disease. And when you and I were at school, not together, um, we probably were taught about myopia being a benign refractive condition that um, resulted in a lot of people coming through our practice doors. Mm -hmm. And we could correct it with spectacles, contact lenses, and obviously we both have seen refractive surgery become a significant player, or perhaps not as major a player as uh, people anticipated. Um, mm -hmm. We've been able to manage it now for 20 years with uh, overnight corneal reshaping, whether you call that orthokeratology or um, a CRT, uh, to use one of the brand names. So there's been the refractive care element of myopia um, and you know it was there uh, much like presbyopia and astigmatism just not mm -hmm. as difficult to explain so the, the real change in the last 20 years has been twofold um, up until 20 years ago or even as recently as 20 years ago we didn't have any good ways to slow um, the progression of myopia. Bifocals didn't work. Um, progressives didn't work or didn't work well enough. Um, the only game in town really was 1% <clears throat> atropine, and that's not something that people found particularly palatable in terms of uh, the side effects and needing to put kids into progressives and photochromics and you know, rendering them uh, unable to accommodate. Of course, if you're myopic, you can always take your glasses off. I know I do. So the, the big sea change of the last 20 years has been a better understanding of the underlying mechanisms um, 
and a huge, significant body of animal research that has really pointed us in new directions, but also um, been a really important underpinning for some of the clinical therapies. So what we have now that works that we didn't have 20 years ago is low concentration atropine, although we could argue what the concentration should be. Um, overnight orthokeratology that not only can temporarily, temporarily reduce myopia, but it can also slow its progression. And a whole host of uh, contact lens options, um, one of which my site is FDA approved. And then maybe we won't have time to talk about it today, some spectacle solutions that really do work in a way that PALs and some other options probably don't. Mm -hmm. Now, um, somebody in industry once sort of paraphrased me and said, you know, you don't have a market until you have a product. Um, and I would say with myopia, when we couldn't do anything about slowing its progression, we tended to downplay it as a disease. Right. Now, um, because we have ways to treat it, we have um, we feel like it's okay to talk about some of the bad stuff that happens with myopia. Yeah. And I draw two analogies. One is dry eye disease. Dry eye disease became a big thing for optometry and eye care in general once we started to have FDA-approved drugs, but we also had technologies that would allow MGD to be treated by warming and expressing glands, okay? That's, in my mind, that's when dry eye took off. And to use a, an unsavory um, example is we never talked about ED before there was the little blue pill, okay? Right. Now, all of a sudden, it's a thing because why? We can treat it and people can monetize it. Yeah. So um, you may want to cut some of that out, of course, Dave. <laughs> I actually don't think we need. I don't think we need to. But I think you know what you're saying is you 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 don't have a you don't have a disease until you have a solution, and that's because we don't necessarily want to really talk about it. Because what are you going to do about it, right? You're going to say to a kid, you know, you're going to progress, become super nearsighted like your parents, and then you're going to develop. You know, you're going to have 128 times risk of developing a retinal detachment when you get older if you're like your mom. So good luck to you. Well, what are we going to do about it, Doc? <laughs> Nothing, right? Yeah, so, it's not. It's not. It doesn't really sort of doesn't you know, ring the right way. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I think we've always been aware of these things, and particularly with rel relation to um, um, retinal detachment and glaucoma. Um, you know, open angle glaucoma. We associated for with being increased risk associated with myopia. But now, the other thing that's happened, of course, is the prevalence is increasing. So the number of myopic people walking on the earth is going up dramatically. We've seen that uh, um, epidemic already hit East Asia and um, Western Europe and North America is trending the same way. So... So let we me jump solution. in on that. Go ahead. Let me jump in on that. So is that a form or a function, Mark? Everybody wants to know. You know, we know there's genetic components, but why is it more common now as a percentage than it was, you know, 30, 40, 50, 60 years ago? Well, the genetics are there because, um, you know, but with, in spite of a lot of effort, we haven't found a single gene for myopia. And the with GWAS studies and other technologies I don't understand, we can still only account for maybe 10% of it. But myopia has a huge um, heritability, um, but that may in part may be due to sort of uh, shared intelligence, shared environment with your, with your parents. For something to increase in its frequency, its prevalence so dramatically, there has to be an environmental component. I think everybody would agree on that. And undoubtedly, it's been urbanization and changing education strategies um, in, the, in the Far East that's led to that. And notice I'm passing my words very carefully because whether it's studies in Singapore or Australia or the US 
uh, or China, it's been very difficult to find an association between myopia and near work. Okay. We jump as clinicians, we jump to connections. It's like, well, the myopic eye is like the accommodating eye. It must be accommodation. Okay. Mm-hmm. Um, so it must be the near work. And the one thing that's come out of those large epidemiological studies is a strong association between outdoor time and less myopia. And we know from studies um, from Claire and Olson, Carla Zadnik and colleagues, that um, regardless of how many myopic parents you have, the more or the less time you spend outdoors, the more likely you are to become myopic. So that's something we know about. Um, again, a common sort of... And, and, and the clinical pearl there is that we should be having children spend about two hours outside if possible, or the yeah, more two, the better. Two hours on average a day is the magic number. And of course, yeah. you know, there are, you know, with, with, in a lot of the country, that's not, a, that's not an issue, okay? Because, you know, it's warm enough, kids can go out during recess, they can play after school. Um, but of course, and then there's like, Seattle where it rains all the time and <laughs> yeah, no well, wants to be outside. You know, <laughs> the reason I didn't move to Seattle is the weather's too much like England. And, uh, <laughs> you know, um, I joked that I moved to uh, Boulder because of my seasonal affective disorder and I needed 300 a day, 300 days a year of sunshine. So yes. yeah, an important public health message. If you want to lower the risk of myopia, um, in the you know, in a young child is to um, encourage more time outside, and of course that's that's a great message. Period, because it's mm-hmm. good for cardiovascular, good for obesity, good for reducing the risk of diabetes. So it's something that optometry can really, I think, get behind, and it's something we can all do. If you're squirrely about doing ortho K. If you're not ready for atropine, it's something anybody can do in their practice. Yeah. In terms of counseling patients. And a parent will hug you if you say, you know, they need to spend an hour less on the iPad and an hour more outside. Okay. Yeah. Would, so, Mark, the thing, the thing I always get about that, though, is, oh, so you mean they need to look far away more and do less near work? So right? we know, or is it something about the 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 chemicals that we're getting from the sun? What where where does this come in? Could be dopamine, could be vitamin D, um, could be just pupil size. There could be a dioptric um, component of it. Um, that you know, there's less. I mean, because you know, I'm sitting here in front of my screen, which is about doctor and a half away, but I've got stuff in my peripheral vision that's further away. I'm looking out at mountains over the top of the screen. I've got a rich field, but you know, it, it could be something not only the diopters, but the contrast of diopters or the conflict of diopters between our field. So we know about the association with outdoor activity, but we don't really understand what's the Why? secret sauce. Right. Um, so, you know, how does it work? It just does, damn it. Okay. <laughs> um, and we also know from clinical trials where kids have been forced outside more or sent outside for recess in China um, that it can reduce the incidence. Now, where it's unclear as to whether outdoor activity has any benefit is slowing the progression of myopia. And the body of evidence, the weight of evidence suggests that outdoor activity doesn't really slow progression. There are a couple of other studies that suggest it might. And the other thing that we know from several research papers is that there's a seasonal variation in myopia progression and in axial elongation. So mm-hmm. the eyes of the child grow less during the summer and more in the winter, and there's greater myopic progression during those winter months. So yeah. there's some... I would call it indirect evidence that outdoor activity does have some benefit. And again, it's a great public health message. You know, mm-hmm. you might soft pedal it a bit more, um, but it's it's a good thing. You know, get away, you know, put down the iPad, you know, um, hide it, whatever the parent needs to do. I don't have kids, so it's a battle I don't have to fight. Um, but get outside, good for your heart. Good for your weight. 
Yeah. Be your eyes. So, Goodness. you know, had, uh, had an interesting, uh, read over, uh, over, um, a group of, uh, clinicians who were talking about myopia and this whole concept of this being a disease is really just a ploy to try to sell something new that, uh, really, is it that big of a deal? Is it something that really is going to be changing optometry or is this just a new fad in eye care? Um, knowing that you don't have strong opinions on things, I wanted to ask your perspective on that. <laughs> well, I think um, the data, some of which we've published, um, is fairly compelling. So let me throw some statistics out there, okay? Good. Um, for every diopter more of myopia, your risk of myopic maculopathy later in life increases by about 60%. Your risk of posterior subcapsular cataract increases by 20%. Same for open angle glaucoma, and your risk of uh, retinal detachment increases 30%. That's for every additional diopter. So you can think about what we could save on the other side by controlling myopia. Now, those are diseases, many of which we can treat or manage, okay? You can mm -hmm. manage glaucoma. You can take cataracts out. You know, retinal detachment's relatively rare. Um, when it comes to vision loss, the, the big baddie and the, 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 the tidal wave that's coming is myopic maculopathy because yeah. that will become a major, major um, cause of irreversible and untreatable vision loss, um, first in Asia and then in the West. I want to interrupt you because I want you to keep going. But if you have not seen this, uh, a really impactful uh, article, uh, it, you published this, is why each diopter matters. So if, if you ha want a good read on why this is important, and, and Mark pointed this out, the 67%, the 30%, the 20%, uh, the data, the maculopathy, 40%, uh, just go and Google myopia control while each diopter matters, optometry and vision science. If, if, if that doesn't convince you, that culmination of all that research that you did um, I almost to say brilliant, but I don't want to make your head any bigger than it is, uh, but brilliant, <laughs> a brilliant piece of work. I would highly encourage everybody to read that. So thank you for putting that together, by the way, uh, you you're continue welcome. on, sorry to interrupt. You. Yeah, no, no, no problem. <laughs> and, you know, um, I'll come back to some caveats on that in a minute. Now, um, an even better paper that I think we've just published, and I was touting it on Facebook today because the final version's out there and it looks very pretty, yeah. is the risks and benefits of myopia control. So I don't want to talk about risks today other than the fact that they're much smaller in comparison to the benefits. Um, but in that paper, we talk a lot about the diseases we just listed off, but we also look at visual impairment. And using data out of the Netherlands, we show that each additional um, diopter of myopia is associated with a 25% increase in visual impairment later in life. And by visual impairment, I mean 20, 40 or worse, okay? Although if you can, you choose any other criteria, it's the same. So forget about disease that you might be able to treat, but there seems a very strong association between the level of myopia and the risk of visual impairment. Now, an important caveat, of course, is some people online and uh, elsewhere would say, well, I'm not going to believe that's all cross-sectional data. I'm not going to believe it until somebody does a longitudinal study and shows that if I control myopia by a diopter in a 10-year-old, there's a benefit down the road. Well, it's like dream on. Okay, that study's never going to be done. It's tough enough to do five and 10 year studies. You know, if you think about intervening in a 10 year old and measuring the benefit in a 60 or 70 year old, none of us are going to be around that long to do the study. So, mm -hmm. um, you yeah, know, the analogy I draw is, you know, if somebody walks into your consulting room in Seattle and they're carrying a damp umbrella and their shoes are clearly wet. You really don't need to go outside to know that it's raining. Okay. First, you're in Seattle, so the risk is high anyway. 
<laughs> but that's enough evidence for you, right? And when it comes to visual impairment and myopia, um, there's enough for me, and we're not going to see the compelling evidence that some people demand um, because of just the, the, the duration of time. And I do think we need to be acting rather than just waiting for more science to come along. So, so the, the way we act now, uh, right? So how, how do we present that to a clinician? Because I hear some people say, well, you know, if, 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 if you progress, then next year we'll do something about it, right? Or if they've been progressing for a couple of years, then I consider doing treatment. Um, for, for me, I'm like, right away, let's go. But do we wait for a certain dioptric component, Mark? Do we wait until somebody's a minus one, two, three, five? Or do we start treating at minus a half? Well, um, or would you start treating at plus a half? We'll come back to that in a minute. Yeah, uh, exactly. Well, here's, here's what we know. The earlier the onset, the greater the risk of high levels of myopia. So somebody who doesn't develop myopia until they're 13, they're never going to get to a high level of refractive error that really puts them in the, the danger zone. So each, each diopter matters. You mean they're not on the highway to the danger zone? <laughs> when, when's that, when's that uh, sequel coming out, by the <laughs> I way? I think I, it's supposed to be on 2020. Did that get put off because of COVID? It did. It did. Anyway, we're showing our age here. Um, but, yeah, I think if you've got it – so basically – any kid under the age of 12 is likely to be at risk of developing higher levels of myopia. So you shouldn't be waiting. And if they're in your chair and they're six years of age and they're already minus one, they're going to end up somewhere down the road as a five, six, seven. So now's the time to act. And let's face it, Dave, if you're myopic, you're going to progress. It's a rare yeah. bird that becomes a minus one myope as a child and doesn't progress. Okay. Yeah. And of course it's a great winner in your practice if they are destined not to progress because you can claim success to your lap of honor for whatever you've done anyway. <laughs> but 99% of the kids are going to progress. Don't wait until you see progression. Don't wait until it's minus one, minus two, at least start having the conversation with the parent pull up the BHVI calculator and show what their trajectory is likely to be based on their current age, their race, and their current prescription, um, and have the conversation. Um, so because- now we've got a, we've got a, a, a five-year-old, mm-hmm. and they are Plano, all right? Uh, and their older brother is doing myopia management. He's a minus two, and he's eight years old mm-hmm. or nine years old. And mom and dad are minus six or seven. So are we waiting until a five-year-old? Or ding, what are ding, we ding, do? ding, ding. You know, it's going to happen. Okay. It's, that's that rainy, that's that, that wet shoes, and that's the yeah, wet umbrella, it's gonna, right? It's going to happen, you know. It's three things so you can do. So what do we do? How, how, as a clinician, how would you interject and in intervene in that patient? Well, it's, um, remember, when it comes to treating, what we, we call that now, it's an accepted term. We call that pre-myopia. So mm-hmm. at that age, and let's take a six-year-old because that's where the data are strongest. If they have less than three quarters of a diopter of hyperopia, hyperopia, therapy, yes. okay, yeah. Um, so six-year-old plus O fifty, five-year-old Plano, regardless of family history, the family history and the brothers has already influenced um, their risk. Okay, it's already had its effect. They're at risk with that refractive error. And again, you can have the conversation about what we might do, um, but you can already start to be proactive and say, you know, we can, if we can get him outside a little more, maybe we can stave it off, but it's going to happen. The challenge is we don't have a lot of good options right now of treating that kid. You know, can you get an amotropic kid to wear glasses? Good luck with that. Okay. Contact lenses, don't think you're going to do that. Ortho K, could you design a lens? Maybe. I'm not as skilled as you. Um, Put a drop of atropine in. Yeah, that would, that's probably the best option. But the, 
the evidence is kind of wafer thin that it mm-hmm. would work. But remember that premyopic eye has already probably started to accelerate and, you know, put in drops. It's, it's a pretty, um, how shall I say, passive treatment to put in atropine in a kid, particularly if Big Brother's already using it. Um, mm-hmm. You know, just uh, brush your teeth, put your drops in, or if the kid doesn't like doing the drops, wait till they're asleep, you know, put it on their uh, eyelashes and just give them a little tug. Um, that yeah. that would, And, again, I think if you've got um, motivated parents, um, you know, they'll be game, particularly if you say, look, yeah. um, this, this is going to happen. The sooner we jump on it, the better the long-term outcomes that we can have. And, you know, I was um, talking with uh, Justin Kwan uh, the, other, um, the other day. So he and I overlapped at uh, SCCO for a year. Um, I knew him when he was in practice and now he's with Cooper Vision, but he and his wife are both minus 10. Okay. And they've got a couple of little kids and they're Asian. You know, it's going to happen. So he's already thinking, okay, what can we do? What should we do um, about this? So motivated parents, um, you know, you get to be the doctor, you get to have the conversation, you get to make the recommendation. But mm-hmm. um, as I said, the, the evidence is a little thin, but um, I think it's, again, a reasonable inference that this in a high-risk kid is something you might want to consider and the other one of the other sort of calculations I've recently done, when you look at pro- rates of progression as a function of age of incidence, if you can delay, particularly in an Asian kid, if you can delay the onset by a year, that'll save you three quarters of a diopter, okay? Kid needs to be in my sight for three years to save three quarters of a diopter on average. So a little bit of prevention is worth a whole lot of cure. Um, yeah. So again, get in them early. And you know, we talk about the epidemic of myopia. Okay, we can slow progression with all these fancy new technologies, but we're not going to lower the prevalence unless we intervene early and stop it even occurring or at least delay it. Um, yeah. So there's work to be done for everybody here. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, we'll leave uh, below uh, a couple of things in the in the comments or in the in the show notes. Uh, the BHVI calculator, which is an incredible tool in the mm-hmm. uh, consulting room, as you would call it, or the exam room, as we would call it. Um, also, uh, 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 kind of a link to that. Uh, why every diopter matters. I really mm-hmm. think that's an incredible read. For everybody, and I like it's a short read. <laughs> it is. It is. It's. Uh, it's not a long journal article. Uh, no, it's but about it's just two a, pages. The two one pages. we just published is closer to twenty pages. So I'll, okay, I'll send that's you a little link different. That one as well. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So great. Um, but I really like you know what what came out of this conversation is the preventing myopia, um, not just preventing myopia progression, but preventing myopia. And as we look to the future, you know, slowing myopia progression is, is, is a good place for us to start. And most people need to start doing that. But as we look to the future, the next thing that we're going to be doing is how do we prevent myopia possibly from ever happening? Or if we can keep people in a minus a quarter, minus half, that's a really good place to be. And this six-year-old that you and I were hypothetically discussing is the next arena, I think, of where the research needs to be with preventing myopia in children. Um, so, uh, great perspectives, absolutely. Yeah, but it's, um, yeah, it's an exciting time to to be uh, engaged in this, and for anybody who has a passion for um, children or you know managing a family, okay, managing yeah. a family of in your practice where you've got myopic parents where you've got my oats in waiting for kids. I mean, it's a very exciting thing. And you know, if we can dovetail it with some other endeavors, you know, kids are coming in ideally for infancy visits at two, three, five, you know, doing a risk assessment at the age of five or six and getting a, you know, just doing a psychoplegic refraction on the kid and saying, okay, where are they now? How much risk do they have? 
and at least having the conversation with the parent and planning the next few years of uh, their care. It's, this is what we want to do. We'll see them in a year, see how things are going, and we can reassess. In the meantime, do A, B, and C. Um, mm -hmm. And it, it's, I think it's, it's probably the best practice builder out there right now in terms yeah. of getting the, getting the family conversations going. Yeah, absolutely. Well, Mark, thank you so much for joining us for this episode of the Myopia podcast. Always a pleasure to talk to, uh, talk to you and hear your insights. Thank you for your research and how you help make it something clinically relevant to us in the exam room. Uh, we sure appreciate your perspectives. Thanks again. Well, thanks for having me, Dave, and look forward to the, uh, the next episode. We'll have to plan that. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Have a good one, everyone. And uh, please uh, make sure to subscribe and like below. And uh, we'll, uh, we'll chat with you next time. This podcast was brought to you by Optometric Insights Media. If you enjoy our content, please leave a five-star review. And don't forget to subscribe for more great episodes.